Rubin, two grindy games over Ben Freeman. Well, there's there's nothing other than grindy yeah. games for Abzan, yeah. I don't think. Well, I mean, yeah, same thing. We say Steve Rubin quietly did something. You know, we also say the Abs on deck played a grindy yeah. game. And so Steve Rubin's four and one. Alrighty. Welcome back to the booth. Brian well, David Marshall, Bob Marr. Uh, Abs on doing what it does best. Yeah. Playing planeswalkers, killing things. Yep. Uh, just putting difficult to deal with threats onto the board. It just very flexible creature base, very flexible uh, suite of spells. Just making sure it can pivot and turn and stay one step ahead of its competition. I know. I know. Uh, Randy's been doing this gauntlet of greatness thing on on Magic Online. Has he, have you done Jund versus Obzon yet? Have Have you had the the Jund on Jund violence of Jund versus Obzon? Not put an obs on deck into the queue yet. Yeah. Maybe next season. Okay. I kind of, I'm kind of curious to see where that goes. Yeah, I probably will put one in for next season. So uh, we're just seeing where we're at right now in terms of... Okay. So we're going to bring okay. Steve Rubin in for, for a quick interview. Yeah, we'll uh, talk to him for just a moment and yeah. then get back to uh, Legacy. Yeah. And then, Brainstorms uh, and Emrakuls and Stoneforges oh. and... And Delver's Whatever secrets. else we can find, yeah. I love, I love that you can have, you know, that sort of one to fifteen. Yeah, with the whole range of casting costs. Hey, I like seeing formats that have Eldra Eldrazi's as we're, you know, moving towards uh, Battle for Zendikar. Yes. No idea exactly what's going to come back from from that cycle I'm, of creatures. I'm, I'm excited about the one Eldrazi that they revealed. Yes. Oblivion Sower seems fantastic. It's, it's some of the mechanics that they've already shown also. I mean, it looks very interesting. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. It, it's, you know, uh, I mean, bas basically, Oblivion Sower feels like Primeval Titan to me. Mm -hmm. You know, six mana, you know, maybe maybe it hits you. I don't know what your yeah. average expectancy is on the lands, but... I don't know. Actually, just reading that card, just it tells me that things being removed from the game is, is more of a more of a thing in this set than another set, so... Because it seems a little odd for the card just to put four out of the game and then, right, yeah, and yeah. then go searching for lands and... I mean, maybe that they... I mean, maybe you, if you end up playing it in some sort of constructor that also has treasure crews, like, you might just cash it in. Like, <laughs> hey, I get all the sack lands and all the other things you took out for treasure crews, but uh, I, I just feel like there's going to be more mechanics building up that out-of-the-game card, yeah. which I enjoy zones that don't get as much concentration and other blocks really being uh, used in the, in the design space, just keeping right. the game fresh, coming up with new mechanics. I mean, it's a tough job. Yeah. No, they, and, and they, they do they do they do a great job of it. You know, again, you're seeing all these cards that uh, you know make their migrate their way back into older formats. Mm -hmm. You know, you see you know a card like Monastery Mentor, which is you know a pretty new card. You know, making its presence felt in Legacy, making its presence felt in Vintage. Yeah, you know, pretty pretty challenging. Like you know, it's like how do I make this card that you know can sort of play fair? Or not even play fair. Like Monastery Mentor hasn't even has barely seen any playing time in standard. Yeah, I, I haven't right. seen Monastery Ma Mentor much in standard at all. Yeah, you know, and then this is a card that can, but, but, but can sort of, I don't, know, I don't know if flourish is the right word, but it, mm -hmm. certainly, it certainly found its niche yeah. in, in Legacy and Vintage, right? Certainly. So, uh, you know, that's, that, that's, a, that's a pretty impressive accomplishment that, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's hard to say, you know, it's not a task, a task you don't envy, because who doesn't, <laughs> you know, who doesn't really want to work in R&D, but... I don't know. It seems impossible. It seems like such a, a t tough. Uh, you, you, so many masters to answer to yeah. in that situation. Yeah. So we're joined by Steve Rubin, the current uh, Platinum Pro, number yeah. 17 ranked player in the top 25 rankings. Yeah, thanks, guys. Obzon Master. Yeah, that's what they call me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just take it, take what I get, you know. <laughs> so, uh, how has this year gone for you in terms of accolades? Like, how, how have you dealt with the idea that people are suddenly, you know, over the course of the year have become more yeah. and more familiar with you and you've become more of a known presence? Yeah, on well, it's, it's definitely becoming, like, noticeable that uh, it's happening, but I know, I, I just, like I said, I take it as it comes. I kind of, like, people come up to me more often at tournaments now and, you know, it's, it's not really much different. I still focus on the tournament, so. Well, I'm glad this feature man match went better than the previous one. Yeah. I was going to start to feel bad if every time yeah. you're in the feature match, you're yeah, in well. 
Um, yeah, Ben kind of fought it out a couple times, but. How, how is that matchup for Abzan? It, it's one of um, it's it's ob it's a good matchup for Abzan. Like usually, if you're playing the heroic deck, you don't really want to play against Abzan for the most part. You'd much rather play against a more aggressive Abzan deck without Languish or Elspeth. So that's fair. Um, so as far as what you've seen out of the rest of the field, does it look like a, a good choice for the day or? Does it just um, happen to be the deck you're most comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird because it's the deck that, like, I'm pretty much known for, so I don't want to necessarily give away any information on what I may or may not play at Worlds, so it's oh, kind of fair. like, like, I play it because, you know, it's what's expected of me, and it's kind of, like, it's a good deck anyway, you know, yeah. it's not, there's nothing wrong with it, I just... You're not giving up anything by playing it. Yeah, I'm just, it's what people expect me to play, so I'm just going to play it, and like, like Brian said earlier, like, I have played it more than any other deck, so it's it's never a bad choice for me to play it. <laughs> Great. Well, congratulations yep, on the win. Thank you. Uh, best of luck the rest of the day. Good luck at Worlds. And yep. uh, I think our, our legacy match has, has gotten underway, so I think we're going right. to cut back to covering that. All right. See Have you a guys. Great day. Thanks. Hey, Bob. Randy, how are you doing? I'm all right. I'm happy to be back in the booth watching a little more Shardless Sultai. Do I have to call it Shardless Sultai? Uh, I want to call it Shardless Bug. It's what I've been calling it for years. Shardless Sultai. The lands deck from Daryl Ayers, huh? So I saw a lot of lands last night in the grinder. Okay. Which I lo I love the idea of the lands deck. Yes. It just if I was to play in the Legacy Champs, I, I would enjoy playing. It. <laughs> I would not necessarily think I was going to do incredibly well, but I would certainly enjoy myself playing that deck. Sure. I think these guys are three zero. They're either or four zero. They're either four zero or three one. Oh, these are the three ones. Yeah, we had. Uh, Four undefeated in the future match area this round. These are the two, three ones. Eleven rounds of Swiss. Eleven rounds. Seven hundred and forty-four players. Definitely got to play that top eight tomorrow rather than today. You know the other tournament that's going on here today? There is a hundred-person grinder going on for Vintage Champs. Look, the amount of excitement I've seen for the Vintage Championships yesterday and today, I mean, I love it. It's I, unprecedented. I, it is. It really is. hundred people for the grinder. Maybe there's Six. some sort of league online that's really bolstering <laughs> participation in events like that. I like it. So how how does the land deck actually work? I think they have a bunch of different angles they can attack from. Whether it's Dark Deaths and Thespian Stage, whether they uh, uh, it depends on the, the attack they necessarily take with an individual build. We have all the deck lists except that one. Is that what's going on? We have five deck lists for this round. Hooray! <laughs> there oh, it is. That's my I found it. Mana bond, so exploration. They can just they can kind of turtle with uh, punishing fire and grow over the burn willows. Sure. We can dark depths, that's being stayed. Yeah, it's four sets of stage, four dark depths. That seems like the primary victory condition. Yes, definitely. Crazy. And then crop rotation to set it up, gamble, life in the loam, exploration and mana bond. What is the count here? 7, 8, 9, 12, 20, 28, 30, 35 lands. Yep. And then the spells all have to do with lands. If we count gamble, because since you're gambling for land and the only thing and, in the deck. And punishing fire because I was gonna say punishing, off a land. Yeah. Sure, sure. Punishing fire is the only thing that isn't directly involving lands in the deck. Oh, well, it, now we have Depth Thes Thespian Sage. Indeed. So, stage, so. so Dark Depths comes into play with 10 counters. Uh, the way you're supposed to get the counters off of it is three mana at a time to get your 2020 Flying Indestructible Merit Lage token. But if you have a way to just cheat the counters off of it, then you can put Merit Lage into play for free.
Yep. And that so is exactly what Ryan sees coming. Yeah, Ryan has now gone into overdrive. I, I need an answer and I need it now. Now, the trick here being that Thespian Stage can copy the Dark Depths, and since it didn't come into play with a bunch of counters, it just copies and turns into a version that doesn't have any counters on it. So, the quick way for 2020s. Yeah, what is Ryan supposed to so do about are, this? I didn't, re I didn't realize it was already 1-1. One one. Yeah, this is game yeah. three. The, uh, yeah, we st the standard match started. There were still 10 minutes left in the legacy round, but yeah. it went a little while. So these guys have actually already played a couple of games before we uh, finished up with the Steve Rubin match. And here we are in game three. So what does he have to do about a 2020? Uh, well, Wastelands are good. Certainly. Thespian Stage is three mana to activate, right? So I think that waste it's only two to activate, so... He's actually capable of activating it in response to a Wasteland, which means the Wasteland is not good enough here. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> the Baleful Strix flying seems, Still seems and very touch. risky not to at least just go ahead and put the Wasteland into play. Wow. Um, Abrupt Decay can kill the token. And yeah, now there's the trick. Thespian Stage, he goes he ahead and activates it. Because is it? Le it's is a legendary it, land, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so they're both going to die. wants to keep, and then that one dies and becomes a twenty twenty. Exactly. There's punishing fire. Down goes your baleful strix. No, for so well. Baleful strix very important, says Ryan. So at this point, are we just hoping for the never-ending string of blockers? Uh, until you find an abrupt decay. Oh, it's indestructible. indestructible, of course. It's indestructible. I'm thinking about the fact that it's got no converted mana cost, but yeah, Merrill Age is a problem. Yeah, I really feel like on the last turn, if he just puts the Wasteland into play, his opponent can't activate the stage. You put Wasteland into play, you can't activate the Wasteland either, but at least you get into this detente, hey, right? I think you're perfectly happy with a standoff versus right. looking for the never But it is a standoff, box. right? Now, see, now with Jace, he, if he has another blue mana in his hand, because he can make one there. Blue to no third mana, but Liliana oh, gets it done. Oh, okay. That works. Oh, so he has actually quite a few ways. Liliana does get the job done. Liliana gets the job done. Jace gets the job done. I mean, quite a few ways. It's two copies of each of those Planeswalkers. Yeah, but he has each Planeswalker in his hand. And that maybe explains why he was okay with... Uh, Having right. Merit Leech happen there. He had Force of Will so that he knew he'd have one turn of chump blocking. Wow. Oh, Ryan Laughlin well has maneuvered this very well, I agree. Maze of If. <laughs> I wonder if he attacked with the Death Rate Shaman if it gets mazed. <laughs> it's one of those cards I think I would just prefer it hit me for one. <laughs> Seems like the least dangerous mode of Death Rite Shaman. Jace discarded the Liliana. Wow. Wants to keep Force of Will blue card. The blue card certainly could be Jace. No, the art's different. No, I'm saying. No, yeah, you can keep Force of Will blue card where your choice. blue card is Jace, yeah. right? What did he keep over? Brainstorm, I believe. Really? He even has Jace mana. So yeah, Liliana there you go. and then abrupt decay the Mox. Wow. So Liliana ticked up, and Daryl didn't want to discard well, you, his crop rotation. He chose to crop rotate away the maze. But why not instead. abrupt decay the Mox instead of discarding it? I got nothing. I kind of like abrupt decaying the Mox there. I was actually happy with Force of Will the crop rotation, just because then you abrupt decay the Mox, you get to use up all the cards in your hand. Say, Libby. 
that's not what happened. <laughs> Now Punishing Fire gets to kill Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, and that guy should have been eating lands non-stop. I feel like he's used to most turns. It, I mean, I think I'd almost rather just not do the two and eat a good land if it's in there than, Interesting. than eat the crap To rotation. shut down future life from the lumps? Yeah. Maybe he's already gotten all the terrifying lands out of the graveyard and the rest of them are just mana lands. The other issue is like the the ultimate of Liliana does almost nothing. Yeah. Daryl's in so much worse shape if he doesn't have that Mox Diamond. Wow. Alright, Ancestral Visions. Card advantage incoming eventually. Yes. It's coming. Oh, and here we There's go with Grove of the Burn. Fire. There's Grove of the Burn Willows. That means that Punishing Fire gets to start recursing itself. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, right. I still like Ryan's side of this, but Daryl's got game now that he didn't have a couple of turns ago. Yep, now that I have enough permanence, I want to put Liliana in check. So Daryl gained, gained, let his opponent gain a life off the Grove of the Burn Wells, picked up the Punishing Fire, and then cast it, effectively dealing one damage there. That is the combo, Punishing Fire, Grove yeah, of the but, Burn Wells. Yeah, but he just moved it off to Liliana, so his opponent actually still gets to keep that one life. And Punishing Fire is going to continue working on Liliana. Shouldn't they have gone down to three? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's a moot point right now. Math is hard. There's a lot of dice on the, out there. I'm going to cut them some slack. Oh, Niles Bell Bomb. Whoa. Oh boy. <laughs> Things. Uh, well, they were already quite real, but. So Daryl is going to respond by using his grove to get back the punishing fire. Now Liliana is going to tick up. So Daryl casts the punishing fire. Now with Grove of the Burn Willow's tap, there's a window where now Spellbomb can blow away Daryl's graveyard. And us. Yep, and now we have a string of Ancestrals coming each turn after this. Ancestral number one. Still get a draw step too, right? Three cards seems like enough. Why would you want a fourth? Yeah, he, forget, he literally I mean, I, forgot I his draw I don't think step. it's legal to skip your draw step. And then once he sacks the sack land, this is gone forever. Wow, he just forgot to draw a card. Well, this could just get ugly real fast. I'll step. I got all these. How does Daryl get back into this from here? I mean, Tarmogoyf cleans things up pretty quickly. How big is the Tarmogoyf? Is that the count they're doing right now? No one cares that that card was supposed to come before the sack land instead of after. They just gave him a card. 
It's not like it's recoverable. Right. Ancestral, handful of cards, forgot his draw step again? Or no, remembered it this time. Tarmogoyf heads over. looking for this one to wind down. Second time ago, I should clean things up pretty quick. Okay, so this is going to... Uh, and there's the handshake. Yep, Carol yeah. has seen enough. Ryan McLaughlin moves this to 2-1. Now, at this point, if there is uh, more Legacy, we will go to Legacy. Uh, yep. If there's not, we will probably try and just show a glimpse of the WMCQ. Just so everyone at home knows, we're not abandoning Legacy. This is still Eternal Weekend. But as opposed to showing you nothing, we will peek in on the WMCQ from, uh, from time to time. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, look, I'll... Uh I'll peek in on the chat. If you guys would rather see a coming, we'll be back soon screen instead of standard, speak up in the chat. Yeah. I think it's better to peek in on the WMCQ. Uh, the timing is sometimes, I mean, we like to finish the match since it's in the middle of the progress, so right. we will sometimes lose a little bit of legacy. But our thinking is we want to watch legacy. We're here to watch legacy. That is the top storyline. If we got nothing else to watch, though, then. Let's watch Great. some. Uh, let's yeah. watch some standard. I still, think, I still think it's preferable to a blank screen, but we will uh, see what the folks at home have to say. Do not go back to standard. No, don't do any standard. Much rather see come back soon screen, coming soon screen. <laughs> They don't want to miss legacy. No, it's not a crazy position. It's not a crazy position. Like if like, we, we could didn't time come it, to that match until right. game three. If, if we which, had enough cameras that we could just like watch standard and then like leave the standard in the middle of the match and catch every turn of legacy, then okay, that would be one thing. We don't have that though. We have off feature match table. Yeah. And we will if we try to show standard, we are gonna miss some amount of legacy, so so I don't know. I think the people have spoken, Matt. What do you think? Yeah, we appreciate the feedback. We'll definitely be looking at it. If everyone here just... Yeah, not it, willing to miss any legacy. Yeah, it's Eternal Weekend. I mean, I don't come out for commentary very often. I'm only here because it's Eternal Weekend. It's not like Standard is my strong suit. Okay. We actually have a fair amount of time left before Legacy fires again. So I think So all we, the Legacy feature matches are in fact done this round? Yeah, the yeah. Le Legacy is done for this round. We are we are gonna we already have the standard match there. After <laughs> showing this standard match, we will be deciding whether or not this is the last standard match you will see until possibly showing, you know, some top eight or the finals of the WMCQ tomorrow. Yeah, I wanna see the final. Yeah, I think the I, final with the spot on Team USA on yeah. the line, we're showing that one. Yeah. The, I could be talked seems, out of the rest. That one seems like a given. I'd even be willing to miss Legacy or, a Legacy or a Vintage Swiss round. Or, or, yeah, I mean, well, yeah. We, we wouldn't have to miss any Legacy for it. But No, you're basically like, would you rather watch round two of Vintage or the WMCQ spot get determined? Yeah. I'm on the WMCQ spot. But, like I said, we appreciate the feedback. I, I yeah. love hearing for the, from the folks at home that, well, no, we'd much rather see coming back soon and not chance missing I mean, there's, missing there's certainly a little bit of don't show any weight screens, that's the worst part of coverage. Which is why 
we set it up this way because well, I don't like downtime when I'm watching. We're just taking either. a shot. We're just trying to manage multiple tournaments at once. Yeah, the room, the buzz in the room is incredible. Uh, it's it is a cool. great event. I will say, Card Titan, Top Deck Games, putting on a fantastic show here. Um, great energy, great buzz, a lot of. Uh, All right, sounds like the legacy round is going to turn over. There's still ah. 10 minutes left, but most of the rounds are done. So sounds like okay. we're not even going to show any standard. So let the, the people have spoken. Yes, we, we have certainly Don't want to get stuck in a long standard match again. So you get us talking about magic. Yeah, I mean, we were looking at watching Craig Wesco, which I don't think there are any long standard matches when it involves Craig Wesco. It's usually, I don't know, white, white weenie, white green. C5-0 like over there? Guy. It's either 4 1. He was 4 0 when I last checked. Okay. I assume he's now 5 0. Oh, and actually, I should have mentioned him when we were talking about Team Ultra Pro, another Team Ultra Pro member over there in the WMC. Sure. Team. Okay, there's a lot of names over there. Cunio's already been eliminated. Oh. Cunio, Cunio with a 2 2 drop. He tried playing. Uh, he's actually a guy who times everything around the Pro Tours. Like, he'll play experimental decks, he'll. It takes things more seriously when it's time for the Pro Tour than he does for, yeah. for any random tournament. So he's playing a Black Green Constellation deck that you anybody who's watched Standard Super League may have seen him play. Uh. Um, but it did not work out. He still thinks the deck is real, but there you go. <laughs> he still thinks the deck is real. I don't win any games with this, but <laughs> I think the deck is real. Now, he's not saying his Pyromancer's Goggles deck is real. That's <laughs> That one he's actually, I think, never won a game with, despite running it in Standard Super despite League. Despite it looking awesome. It does look awesome. Totally agree. <laughs> now that they know they can get Craig Wesco, they're disappointed. Yeah, I mean, you, can't, you can't you can't make them all happy. Then. No. <laughs> yeah, the vintage trial is uh, not anywhere near our cameras. We will definitely have lots and lots and lots of. But the vintage tomorrow. trial is gigantic. Yeah, I heard 99 people or at least. Yeah, 99, 100 people, something like that. Uh, so it's seven rounds of Swiss, cut to top eight, one of you gets two buys tomorrow. Yeah, the big prize, <laughs> one of you gets two buys. No, in my mind, the big prize is you get to play seven rounds of vintage. Yes, that absolutely <laughs> is. If you it. make it to round seven, congratulations, you got to play seven rounds of vintage. I mean, the diehard you all win. The diehard vintage players, I mean, there aren't that many live tournaments. There's right, more so right. on the East Coast, but I mean, I was talking to someone who lives in Portland now who drove here. Wow. Uh, and it's just one of those things that you just don't have all that many opportunities to play live vintage. Even on Magic Online, a lot of the events don't quite fire. I mean, you're looking to yeah. get 16 people together and they don't always make it. I mean, yeah, they, they usually 100 do. People, yeah. 100 people in a vintage tournament? I mean, that that's an event in and of itself. No, I was like, watching, I was looking at, talking to Steve Menendian and it's, it's actually it's not even clear that it's good for your odds tomorrow to play. Because right. you're sort of like... If you're one of the name players, you're kind of revealing your tech, right? Yep. Are you going to play a different deck on Saturday, or are you just going to you're going to practice the one you're running tomorrow, right? It's, but now it's, everybody it's, it's knows what you're running up. tomorrow, yeah. so it, it's actually unclear whether you're supposed to play your real deck or not. But you're not going to not play. Yep. There's a hundred person vintage tournament available to win. Yeah, all of these guys who travel from all over. I mean, I wish. Uh, I wish I had a vintage deck. <laughs> like, I, I got one, my yeah. backpack. I, I mean, lend I, you one. I would wander around over there and just get some <laughs> games of vintage in. And for those of us who play vintage a fair amount, it, it gets tough. It's hard to find. So I was hanging out over there, and uh, the rumor in the room is that every dealer in the building is sold out of Petrified Field. Yes, I so have heard that rumor as well. The Dredge deck is believed to be a significant portion of the field tomorrow. They're talking, you know, maybe it's 15% Dredge. You know, though, if I was playing a deck, yeah. that really didn't want to play against shops, yeah. I would just go buy all the petrified fields myself. <laughs> okay. I just want to put the, the fear into all of the shops players that maybe they play something else. Yeah, yeah, the dredge deck, pretty good against shops. Yeah. They don't, I mean, if you don't need to, their shops' big thing is you can't cast any spells. The dredge player's like, why would I need to cast spells? Yeah, spells. That's not why? how magic works. Yeah. <laughs> That's so passe. <laughs> Um, yeah, even I was talking to Roland Chang yesterday about, you know, I mean, shop specialist, top eight last oh, yeah. year, just uh, running Martello shops just as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, oh, no, I don't want to play against Dredge. He's like, the first game, I just assume I've lost. And he's like, I have 12 cards that come in out of the board. Wow. And even after that, I just have to hope. 
Yeah, I mean, you can win, but... He's like, you can win. He's like, but if I get paired against Dredge three times in the tournament, I'm not making top eight. Yeah. It's kind of his attitude of it. All right, so if you know the field, what would you play? I would just play Doomsday because it's a deck I really enjoy playing. Okay. Um, it's one of the decks I find challenging because I've never sat, I've never sat down and figured out what Doomsday piles look like. So you get to figure them all so out. So it's always on out fly. on the fly, and that's <laughs> that's fun for me. Sure. Might not be a lot of fun for my opponents just sitting there, but I don't know. The Doomsday deck's great. I think Doomsday is one of the tier one decks in the format. It's got, you know, it's it gets to play a blue control game, right? You have Gush, you have Fast Bond, you have Force of Will, but you also have this combo finish, so you can actually yeah. just race a dredge deck. I definitely have Doomsday as one of the decks I enjoy yeah, playing I, the most. I actually sure. never really worry much about playing against Dredge when I'm playing Doomsday. Like they can certainly win, but I don't feel like I'm terribly disadvantaged. It just doesn't they have a great shops matchup and the shops decks are so good nowadays. Yeah. So you would be on Doomsday. I would be on Doomsday. I really liked uh, Eric's uh, land still deck from VSL. Okay, I haven't got the chance to try that out yet. I'm I'm intrigued. Like he claims to have a great shops matchup, which yeah. is I do think there'll be a lot of shops. Shops are pretty popular on the East Coast in particular. Mm -hmm. You know that's I don't know. It could easily be the most played vintage deck. Although most played is still going to only be in the like 15, 20 percent range. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Delver would would be played <laughs> more than that. Although I mean Delver, Delver and Mentor have sort of. I don't still even know if those are the same deck. They're close. You know, using yeah, Pyromancer to take advantage of all your stuff, or are you playing more lands to go up to Monastery Mentor, which is clearly a more powerful magic card, it's more but powerful also magic costs card. more. I just don't think, I don't know that it's necessarily worth the sacrifices you have to make. However, like, um, Rodrigo Torres won a large vintage event in Europe with a mentor deck that, mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, it was a great deck, and he's also a great eternal player. I don't think he's here this weekend. He was in town la uh, last year for vintage. But, okay. Uh, I uh, was one of the group that traveled in from Spain. The last big uh, U.S. vintage tournament was won by Dredge, right? The yes. NYSE Stax Exchange? Yes. Uh, and I saw he, they, he was over in an area talking to um, basically a new vintage player. Like he's he's laying out all of his reasons why and like going over sideboarding. So it is a great community. And yeah. you talk about someone who won the last big vintage tournament talking to someone who's playing Dredge at his first vintage event and just kind of laying it all out there. Like yeah. just explaining all of it. Um, so, I mean, not that there's a whole lot of high tech decisions in Dredge, but I'm sure he has something that nobody else has. Like, no one mm -hmm. goes from the last Dredge event, uh, or not from the last event winning with Dredge and doesn't change anything going into this one. Yeah, you I mean, you actually have room. Like, the basic Dredge deck is only like 40, 45 cards. And you're like, do you have mental missteps in your Dredge deck? Do you have Force of Wills in your Dredge deck? Yeah. Are you a Vengeful Pharaoh kind of guy? Are you a Petrified Field guy? So that you're redundant against the Wastelands out of the Shops deck? Yeah. Like, there's, there's a little bit of room there to innovate. Are you a... Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the pitch discard spell that Martell always has in his dredge decks. And I've also unmask. Right? Are you an hate, unmask guy or just a therapy? Some of the hate moving away from some of the standard cards. Also, um, I've seen way less uh, Graft Digger's cages in vintage sideboards lately because they feel like all the decks that like Graft Digger's cage just has splash damage against a bunch of vintage decks. Yep. But people have also decided that those vintage decks are also really good at dealing with Graft Digger's cage. Sure. So they've just decided it just doesn't work the way it used to. Like they just yeah. Some of that is, else. I think, um, both of Druid's decks because of the existence of Graft Digger's Cage all seem to now have a show and tell plan. Yep. Right. That was the that's the reason I think Graft Digger's Cage is such an easy, obvious sideboard card. Is not only is it good against Dredge, though, as you say, they know they have to fight you. Yeah. It's also good against Oath, though, as you say, they know they also know they need to fight you, and they can either fight you by destroying the cage, or I think the show and tell plan is really smart mm -hmm. if you're on Oath. I Yes. Uh, I mean, participating in Vintage Super League, I mean, has me reinvigorated in the format. We get to see all sorts of fun things. We deal with our own metagame. I don't think any of us ever claim the metagame in Vintage Super League is the same as your local Vintage tournament, but we have had more people playing shops lately. It, but, it, yeah, it started out as very blue, no shops, yeah. and now it's kind of migrated to like almost accurate, I feel like. It's getting closer. It is correcting itself. You can't just assume no one will play shops, like, you like I did when I played the, the Belcher deck. All right. That was just like, no one will run shops. I can beat everybody else in. And then Chris and I went like 5-1 with I, that I, also, I still think there's an over-representation of Doomsday. Sure. 
but I mean, Just we are talking about fun. highlighting. It's fun. <laughs> it's a type of deck a lot of players on Vintage Super League find really interesting. So you have some really good players who can manage the intricacies of the deck and no, that's getting it played a little bit more. That's probably fair. But like bringing it back to Legacy, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk all day tomorrow about everything going on in Vintage. You promise? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, I'm in. I, in. I, I'm already to excited it. for it. Same. Um, for Legacy, if you had to take a shot in the dark, what style of deck do you think will win the champs today? I mean, it's either going to be Stoneforge Mystic based, or it's going to be Miracles. Okay. Those are those are my. I, I mean, I just think those decks, those strategies. So the thing about Legacy is, it's the brainstorm format. Can I just pick yes. brainstorm? Yeah. Okay, if I, if, you're, if I can pick a card, there are going to be four Brainstorms in the winning deck. Right. That's my limb that I'm going to inch out onto. We're, 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 like, we're putting the over-under on Brainstorms <laughs> in the top eight at like 28.5. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good over-under. I mean, I, and I think it's actually one of the reasons... I like the way Vintage and Legacy have evolved, and I think mm -hmm. that Arnie has actually done this on purpose with the banned and restricted lists where... Brainstorm is a really interesting magic card. It's also incredibly powerful magic card. Like, I wouldn't want Brainstorm to be a four of in both Vintage and Legacy, because I feel mm. like they would become too similar. Yeah. And I wouldn't want it to be, you know, banned in Legacy, restricted in Vintage, because then you never get to have the fun of playing with Brainstorm yeah. and fetch lands. Brainstorm like, never I does like the way Legacy gets to be the Brainstorm format, but then Vintage isn't. I, I think, think that's pretty smart. I think there's a couple of cards that they've acknowledged are probably a little too powerful, but but they don't break the format, so it's allowable. Like, like I think Brainstorm and Legacy, yeah. it's probably the best card. Yeah. And Shops and Vintage. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, Mistress Workshop just does so much work. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But you, the, you could still have a healthy format while it exists, even if it's just incredibly powerful. And I think Brainstorm is the same way in Legacy. Yeah, I do think that the shop stacks in Vintage have gotten a little bit too annoying. Like, I kind of want them to address shops with a, with a restriction at some point. But no way should they restrict the workshop itself. Right. Even though it's the best card in the deck, it's, it's the only reason the deck exists. And it is kind of cool that there's this crazy artifact deck floating around as a staple in the metagame. Absolutely. Just, just, just get, don't let them have four chalices. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe maybe if they get too good, on, you take away three of their lodestone golems. They already restricted Trinosphere. How far are you really going to push this? Farther. Did you play any vintage when you could play four Trinospheres? <laughs> yeah, I did a little bit. <laughs> it, was it was dumb. Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> It was, it, it was a thing to behold, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, so... Okay, so Do you have a pick I, for, for Legacy? I, I was at the same two. Okay. I, and if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Miracles, but I was really at those two being the top two decks. Yeah, I, I said Stoneforge earlier when Brian asked me. Yeah. It's really, like, I just think the Brainstorm decks are better than the non-Brainstorm decks. That's fair. Yeah. So... Especially while... Dig through time is unrestricted. Like I don't know how long before dig through time is going to be a thing in Fair. Legacy. Like Fair. they already hit the cruise. I, I dig is pretty close. Yeah, it's I don't very know close. that there will be four dig through times legal in Legacy. You know, five years from now. Oh, certainly. Um, are there any like exciting decks that you're looking forward to seeing between here and there? I really wish the the Omni Tell deck would have would have gotten going. I, like I, I enjoy that deck while it's playing out. I felt really bad for his draws on camera. I mean, it's just... I mean, he, he... While everyone didn't necessarily agree with the plays he'd made up to that point, he got into a Force of Will war on his opponent's turn with him tapped out, laid the land, went to Impulse, made phase, and then just didn't hit anything. And then it's just it's just this letdown. Like, you have the yeah. whole build-up to that point where things are just supposed to get crazy and nothing happens. That actually might be my choice to play in a Legacy tournament. I mean, especially if it wasn't like, you know, I'm playing for some super important thing that I, I want to maximize my chances of winning, if I'm just trying to maximize my chances of enjoying playing Magic all day. Yes. The Omnitel deck is cool. Yeah, absolutely. I just, like, the, the situations you get into, that's... That's probably my legacy deck of choice. I, I I completely agree there that it would be an enjoyable thing to do, uh, and it's also I think both the the Stoneforge decks and the Miracles decks have this they have an in inevitability edge. I think the longer the games go, those two decks just get better and better against the field. Yeah, like from turns five, like up to turn five, it's anybody's game. Kind of from turn five to seven on, like it's like that boa constrictor. Like things just keep getting tougher and tougher to win. They keep sculpting their hand. It keeps getting better. Like, you might not realize it from the other side of the table, but it's 
it's a tough nut to crack. So I see another another vintage deck they're talking about in the chat here. Um, we have not, it's one we have not seen in Vintage Super League, but I think Bomberman is real. Oh, uh, so actually my favorite, if I was playing in Vintage Champs, I know I keep telling everyone Doomsday, uh, David Williams and I have been talking quite a bit about Bomberman. Yeah. It just doesn't work on Magic Online. Right, I know, you can't test it. Right. Like you could run it in VSL and people would just scoop when you've right. got it, but like the way, so the Bomberman deck, I think most of you guys probably know this, but you get out uh, Black Lotus and then the Bomberman is, uh, good lord, I'm blanking on card names today. 3W, 2, 4, 2 mana, return an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. Right. right. That's the combo, so you have infinite mana if you get the Black Lotus and the guy. Now what are you going to do with your infinite mana? Well, they tend to have a spell bomb. The new tech in Bomberman, I mean new, it's like six months old, is Tassiger, Right, of course. it's Tassiger. Now, once you have infinite mana with Tassiger, you can mill your entire library, and you can effectively just- Put them all in your hand. Pick up every single card you have. Right. Okay, great. Not hard to win from there. Yeah. Hard to actually execute on Magic Online. Yes. If, if you're playing a deck, and then once given infinite mana, <laughs> and you get to put all the cards in your deck into your hand, and you can't win, I, 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 I have no sympathy That's for That's not it. a thing. I mean, the way to actually look at it is to say, okay, I've got this combo deck. I can kind of play a control game, right? They're a right. blue-white control deck. Um, do you, how many bad cards do you have to put in your deck as victory conditions? And the thing that Tassiger does is say, I'm not actually a bad card. Yeah, no, I'm have not. You, have you played against the Tassiger in Vintage? It's immortal. Yeah. Nothing kills it. Yes. it you, 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 you look at this lightning bolt in your hand, and you're like, plow, right? how big is that guy? Yeah. Four or five? I have like Pyromancer, Snapcaster, Token Token. Yeah, I'm just looking at the mental misstep going, he only paid <laughs> one for it, this should work. Right. <laughs> uh, right. I guess I can't win. So I actually, I played, uh, there's a monthly Friday Night Magic that uses the vintage format back home, Mox Boarding House, it's awesome. So once a month, whenever I'm in town, I go. Uh, the 3 3 match, the, the finals for Friday Night Magic Club two weeks ago, was me versus a Bomberman deck. And so, yeah, this Tasker experience, I went through that. Yeah. Just like, never leaving the table. It's just permanent. And I actually do think that that makes Bomberman legitimately better now than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. That your victory conditions, all of a sudden, like a one mana 4-5, it's decent. Yeah. And it's a card drawing engine, right? You just see these cards, even the 2-4 for 4, you're I mean, gonna pay three and, a, 3 and a white, but a 2-4 creature's pretty hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. Like it, it blocks if that's relevant, it can attack, and vintage, so much of vintage comes down to these games where everybody's powerful cards just cancel each other out. Right. And like it's just like what's left over? We're gonna stare at each other in top deck for five turns. Well, you have a two four. That's actually a relevant threat. Yeah, Bomberman is very much like Doomsday, where you've got this this good control suite, but you can win out of nowhere. Right. And I think Bomberman's control suite is just better than Doomsday. Yeah. The other thing that uh, it was Greg Mitchell, who's here actually, flew here from Seattle um, to play the, the vintage vintage champs. He had a couple mentors in there. So he's just like, I got this blue-white control shell, and I've got my Bomberman combo, why don't I just play Monastery Mentor? I've got all the cantrips. I mean, it doesn't have as many cantrips as the, the more Delverish decks, mm -hmm. but Mentor's still a really good magic card. So he just threw a couple in for value. I don't know if that's the right answer, but it's the way Greg had it set up. Legacy, round six. I have been handed 